Welcome to the Art of the Storyteller. I am your host, John Frazier, and on this program, we celebrate storytelling in its purest form, unsullied by modern technology, such as cinematic special effects or the written word. Just direct communication between speaker and audience, from my lips to your ears. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna tell you a story. There's not gonna be a script. There's not gonna be any cuts or edits. It's just one continuous take. The art of the storyteller. Let's begin. So our first story begins in a town. I mean, it could be in the countryside or a village or a city, but I think it's a town specifically. Why a town? I don't know. I guess it kind of sounds like a middle-sized population, a place where you could run into a stranger or you could run into a friend. And if you ran into a friend, it would be a little bit of a surprise. You would say, hey, friend, fancy running into you here. I didn't expect that. And they'd say, it's a small world. And you'd say, well, yeah, it is pretty small, but you know, the town is getting bigger. Why, they just opened up a new supermarket over down on Elm Street. And you would say, oh, have you been to that new supermarket on Elm Street? Because I heard it was pretty good. And you'd say, well, the floors are very clean, don't have the same sort of scuff marks you get at the old place down on 34th. And you'd say, well, yes, that's true, but 34th does have that cashier who likes me. And you'd say, oh, there's no way that that cashier likes you. They're just being nice, that's part of their job. You'd say. But we went to high school with that cashier, and I almost went to prom with that person. I'm being vague about the genders here because I want to be universal with the experience. You know, the cashier is really just a metaphor for our lost youth. Seriously. <laughs> okay, so, you know, you have this conversation. That's the sort of town you can live in. One where, you know, you run into a your old high school flame at the new, uh, at the old supermarket, and that's an argument against going to the new supermarket. I mean, maybe you'll get back together, maybe you won't, but it's nice having that that boost, that validation that comes from flirting with the cashier every day. Uh, not that you go to the store every day. I mean, you really should shop more than one day at a time. It's more economical, but assuming that you were frivolous enough with money, or perhaps you just enjoy the social aspect of shopping. You could go to the supermarket every day, you could see your old high school flame, and you could use that as a reason not to go to the new store. That's the sort of town you live in. So I guess this is modern day because it's got supermarkets and everything. I mean, it would be weird if I went on this big, long metaphor about supermarkets as a sort of a symbolic representation of what the town represents. And then it turns out we were in ye old medieval times. I mean, ye old medieval supermarket. You don't even have high schools back then. You'd say, uh, verily, I encountered yon wench that doth danced at the maypole uh, spring anon or whatever. That, that wouldn't be the same sort of conversation. And now I'm picturing like two gnomes having that conversation. That's, a, that's not the sort of story this is. This is a modern, relatable story. You know, it's something that you could picture yourself doing. So it's a town. What's the town's name? Uh, Greenville. Greenville, named for the, by the settlers because it was fertile agriculturally, although ag the agricultural business has been marginal to the town's economy for many years, what with the advent of manufacturing and, the, of course, then the loss of manufacturing jobs to automation and outsourcing. Uh, now, it's mostly just a strip mall, yeah. uh, a commercial center where people uh, gather and perform services in the economy. A lot of uh, grocery store clerks and insurance salesmen and 
healthcare professionals. Healthcare is a big one. People come from miles around to go to the hospital in this town. They would go to the one in the big city, but it's too far away. And of course, the one in the village is much too small. It's more of a clinic than a hospital. So that's another indication of the size of the town. It's got a clinic. It's got more than big enough to have something that's better than a clinic, but not quite big enough to have a state-of-the-art trauma center, for instance. So if you got shot in a hunting accident, you'd be much better off getting a helicopter to take you to the big city than you would be to go into the local hospital. Um, but if you you know, got sick with like a gastroenteritis or something, the local hospital would be more than sufficient to your, death, to your needs. The, the doctors and nurses there are very dedicated. They like their jobs. They want to help people, but they don't have the resources that the big city does. They don't have the same equipment, the same access to rare medicines. So if you've got an allergy to common antibiotics, the local hospital wouldn't necessarily be your best choice. But because you're more rural than the big city hospital, they also have certain advantages, like they have antivenins that wouldn't necessarily be so readily available in the, the big city. Because though farming is still a marginal activity in this town, uh, there are still farmers. There's, You could drive by a farm on your way to the next town over, and you would say, hmm, it's good that some people still work the land. I assume, in this case, that you're a romantic. You've subsumed yourself into suburban life, but you feel keenly your disconnection to the land. So when you see people working the land, it makes you feel connected to your ancestors and your culture and your country. That's a common feeling. Uh, maybe not the most useful feeling, maybe even a little patronizing, but we've all felt it. I know I have. I've looked at the land and said, you know, in another time, I could have been a farmer. And, you know, right, I, I would have been another a farmer at another time. I mean, probably not a very good farmer. I'm, you may have noticed I'm a little verbose. I'd be out in the, the field talking to the cows. It's like, hey, cow, how's it going? You know, this plow is made of steel that I got from the, the blacksmith two towns over. Oh, yeah, there are towns now. I mean, we're in the past, and it's rural countryside, so two towns over is like a, a month's journey. But uh, they have the best steel, so it's worth it, because if you skimp on your tools, then it's just going to cost you more money in the long run. Uh, but of course, uh, while that may have been true, my hypothetical past self does not take into account that there's opportunity costs involved and that going with uh, perhaps inferior but local steel would have saved me the journey, saved me the grain that I needed to feed my horse to, to take me to and fro, and, and of course all of the other things I could have been doing during that month. It may have been a valuable long-term investment, but if I die of malnutrition that winter because I spent a month uh, of good farming time going out of town to buy the best plow available, then you know, it wouldn't have done me any good. But you know, that's all hypothetical. Maybe I would have just been, if it's good enough for my ancestors, it's good enough for me. We can't know, which is why this uh, modern yearning for the land is so patronizing because we're all just people. We're all just getting by in the situation that we've been put in. And that's what people are doing in this town by and large. So, you know, Greenville, as I've described it, is not a remarkable town. It's 
an average town. But that doesn't mean that remarkable things can't happen in it, which is you know why I'm telling you a story about it. It would be pretty odd of me to tell you about an unremarkable town where unremarkable things happened. I mean, one guy got together with his high school girlfriend and she quit the supermarket and later got her real estate license and became very successful, but then they divorced because they had incompatible values. She wanted to raise the kids uh, Catholic and he wanted to raise them Baptist and it just didn't work out. Uh, unfortunately, they got a divorce and she couldn't remarry in the church. And, you know, it was tragic because her second husband was the one. But she always regretted that she wasted her one church wedding on, on this loser from high school. Uh, which isn't really a fair assessment of her ex-husband. Uh, he meant well. Uh, he just didn't have the same sort of intelligence that she did, the same sort of drive. Uh, he wound up uh, being on the road crew, and it's very hard work, very hot. Uh, and he got married uh, a second time and a third time, but the third time was the charm. That's what he always said anyway. Uh, and maybe it would have worked out, except he was hit by a car on the road crew because someone didn't heed one of those on the road work ahead slow to 25 mile per hour signs. Inconsiderate jerk. Killed a promising young man in this prime of his life. He was about 38 years old. He had a long time ahead of him. He could have had kids. He always wanted kids. And he felt like he would have been a good father. But he didn't feel like his financial situation was secure enough. Uh, you know, that was a part of the thwarted dream with his first wife. Her financial situation was secure enough, but they had the incompatible values. And that's the sort of story that I'm not going to tell about this town. I mean, something remarkable happened. What remarkable happened? What do you just wait for? It's a UFO. That's right. Well, it's not a UFO because the people inside the UFO knew what it was. It was a flying saucer, but to some people on the ground, it was unidentified at the time. So for a brief period, it was a UFO. You know, uh, someone in a car driving by, let's make it a lady for representation purposes. You know, a lady was uh, driving down on her car and, you know, uh, she was one of the aforementioned healthcare professionals, a billing agent at the hospital. Not a very popular job, but a necessary one. I mean, I'm not going to get political here about you know, the nature of for-profit medicine, but given the existence of for-profit medicine, whether you like it or not, somebody has got to track those profits. Someone has got to make sure that the money comes in to pay the doctors and the medicine. And that was her job, but it made her unpopular because a lot of the people that she billed were in a very vulnerable situation economically. And that's unfortunate. But, you know, she was the first person to see the UFO, which, I mean, was an exciting story at the office. She didn't tell it for the first couple of days, not until the UFO sightings became more common and it didn't seem so weird that she saw it, but she did take a picture of it with her cell phone. And that picture got published on the internet. And she shared it on Facebook after the, the story blew up and uh, it went viral. She earned, I don't know, 10 grand from advertising revenues for her, her viral video of that spaceship. She probably had a funny reaction to it. Like, oh my God. You know, some people might find it funny. And subsequently award a lot of clicks to a video that had that. And those clicks translated into advertising revenue. That advertising revenue added up to $10,000. She took that $10,000 she went on a vacation. It helped her forget the stress of her job for a while. She came back, and while her job still sucked, from that day on, 
that she had a new perspective on it. She knew that you know, the job didn't define her. She wasn't a villain. Uh, she was just a person trying to get by. And the vacation reminded her of that. How did it remind her of that? I don't know. You connect with your humanity when you're outside your own environment. You feel yourself reacting to the, the world in a new way. And those new sensations remind you of the parts of yourself that you may have buried from practicality's sake. You know, parts of your soul get exercise. And that's what happened to the lady on the vacation. But, uh, you know, that's not for another year and a half in the future. <coughs> in the meantime, she's out on the run runway and her sensible mid-sized sedan, uh, you know, going the speed limit because uh, the sort of person who gets involved with medical building, uh, I imagine to be the sort of person who's also a stickler for the rules. She does what she's got to do. That is her philosophy in life. So she is going exactly 55. And, you know, there's a truck behind her, a long haul trucker who's trying to get his uh, cargo to the big city in time. And he's running late. He's a little irritated that the lady in front of him is only going 55. He thinks that she could go faster because the road is empty and it's night and no one's going to know. And I guess that's really the difference between uh, different type of people. There are some people who, you know, they follow the rules even when there's no one around. And there are other people who feel like the rules are really just to facilitate relationships between people. Uh, and that if you're on your own, you don't need the rules. And, you know, that's a philosophical conundrum. But he didn't see the UFO because he was too focused on the road, which is a good trait in a truck driver. Sometimes truck drivers get a little distracted and sleepy. That can lead to accidents. But this guy had a perfect safety record. Uh, until several years from now when uh, he neglects a uh, speed limit sign through a construction zone and kill, kills, uh, kills a guy kills one of the road workers. And it's not a typical thing for him. What had happened was his father just died, you know, and it was unexpected. It was a stroke and he was still a young man, only 65. So of course he was distracted, that he was crying. He didn't see the sign, which I don't know. I said earlier that the guy who killed the other guy was inconsiderate and maybe he was, maybe he shouldn't have been driving in that state. But that's the hard thing about, about life. You can never tell when people are doing things because of some flaw in their character and when their circumstances are just such that they act in a way that's uncharacteristic. So, you know, lesson learned there, right? But the UFO hovered over town. Now, the alien invaders, well, I don't want to call them invaders because they're not. I mean, I think you'll find at the end of this story that it's a touching tale of reconciliation between two very different viewpoints. But, uh, you know, there was fear initially that these aliens were invaders once they were identified as aliens. When they were UFO, people weren't afraid of anything. They were like, oh yeah, a UFO is probably like a, a cloud or a weather, weather balloon. Something that may have seemed remarkable to someone who is not familiar with the various atmospheric phenomena and the way that they can appear to have uh, volition and unusual movements to someone who is not educated in those matters. Uh, that's what the initial second-hand reports uh, concluded, which is why the lady in the car was so hesitant to tell her co-workers about it, because she didn't want to be uh, perceived as one of those people who would go off on some flight of fancy. 
Uh, little did she know that had she told her co-workers about the UFO, they would have liked and respected her more. They would have viewed her as less of a stickler and more of a regular person. Um, you know, one, they, many of them were fellow building agents, but not all of them were uh, so strict about the rules. I mean, in their job, they had to be very strict because in a job like that, you've got to set uh, strict, um, powerful boundaries so that you don't make the job personal. Because if the job's personal, then it becomes way too hard. You see a sick person and you want to help that sick person, even if the numbers say you can't. And so, you know, you've got to set your boundaries in a job like that. And that's a trait that all of the long-term uh, hospital building agents had. But in terms of things like speeding on the highway or sharing their account of UFOs, uh, the rest of them weren't quite as much of a stickler as this lady. Um, and so if she told them about her experience, they would have found uh, some common ground to bond on. As it is, she was very lonely in her job. Uh, she didn't really have many friends at the office, but that changed after she came back from vacation. You know, much like the vacation changed other parts of her life. So she was the first person to see the UFO, and she didn't say anything. The first person to say something was a kid. You know, um, what was he doing out looking at UFOs? Well, he was an, anima, an amateur astronomy buff. He liked looking through his telescope up at the sky. Unfortunately, uh, you know, years from now, uh, he's going to become a disillusioned with astronomy. I mean, he saw the UFO for the first time, and he has a serious claim to fame being the first person to make contact with extraterrestrial life and report on it. But that was the high point of his astronomy career, 12 years old, and his greatest discovery would never be surpassed. <coughs> it was enough to make anyone disillusioned, which is why college was such a, a, bad, a bad time for him. He tried and tried to, to put his nose to the grindstone when it came to astrophysics and stellar cartography. But, you know, it always came back to that UFO. The damn thing haunted him. And, you know, he was famous even amongst his professors for that. And so he always felt like he had something to prove, <coughs> but he couldn't prove it. I mean, he was a talented kid. And a smart guy and you know in other times less remarkable times he would have been a fine astronomer but he couldn't prove that he was better than just one discovery because that discovery was the best anyone was ever going to make so he wound up doing a lot of drugs and dropping out you know, and he didn't really amount to anything. Wound up selling his telescope when he was 45 years old. Uh, he had to sell it for rent money. I mean, he kept it all that time because there was still a part of him that yearned for the sky. But his dream died. And so, but on the day that he discovered that UFO, he was on the top of the world. He went straight to the mayor. Well, I mean, a kid's not going to meet the mayor. But he went to City Hall and he said, hey, lady, uh, behind the desk. Um, which, you know, the kid, he thought she was a receptionist. She's actually a county clerk, very important elected for position and but you know he's a kid he doesn't know the ins and outs of local bureaucracy and the county clerk's office was really slow that day uh, because 
I don't know, it's the middle of the month and there aren't a lot of auto registrations that had to be turned in. This is just a statistical anomaly. So a kid could walk in unattended, go straight up to the county clerk and say, hey lady, I want to see the mayor. And she would say, hey little boy, are you lost? And he'd say, no, I saw a UFO. And, you know, the county clerk, she was a savvy politician. She knew that this was an adorable story. So, she went and she got the mayor, another lady. You know, ladies can be mayors. And, uh, and she said to the mayor, hey, come get your picture taken with this little kid who's seen a UFO. And, you know, give him a little fake award uh, for, uh, for achievements in astronomy. It'll be cute, we'll take a picture and you know, it'll get in the paper and the water. Uh, and, but the kid, you know, he was a talented kid. He didn't just have, you know, a whim. You know, he could identify. He could show coordinates. And so he had his whole long list. And the mayor, she doesn't know what to do with a list like that. She's uh, more interested in civic governance and not in the details of astronomy. Uh, so, you know, she condescends to the kid well, she pats him on the back and says, very good, uh, keep up the good work. Maybe one day you'll talk to aliens. But, uh, you know, the newspaper gets a hold of this because, of course, they got a hold of it. It was a, a you know, publicity stunt for the mayor. And I guess the mayor and the county clerk are in the same political party, and that is why they're so chummy in the story. I mean, I don't know about the normal... Uh, relationships between county clerks and mayors. Fact, I'm not even sure why the county clerk is in City Hall. I'm guessing that's because this is a town and not a city, and so they've conduct consolidated their city and county governments into one building. But, you know, they contact the papers and the papers write a story about it, and the story includes the kid's measurements because he took careful measurements, because he's serious about science. Uh, and then one of the, uh, the astronomers from the local uh, college outlet uh, sees these numbers in the paper and they help him solve a mystery. They help him figure out what that strange thing he saw was. And, you know, being an astronomer, he is very easily able to rule out many common celestial objects. Thinks maybe this kid really did see a UFO. Why don't we shine a laser to that particular point in space? And so they do, and they discover a UFO, which you know is very scary. Uh, well, I mean, they discover a UFO, but then they conclude that it's got to be an alien spacecraft. Uh, which is a very scary and an exciting time for people because this is it. This is contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, and so over the course of a few days, they modify the laser that they use to detect the, the alien spacecraft into a rudimentary communication device. And once the aliens realize that uh, human beings want peaceful communication, and that these lasers aren't like weapon finders or anything. Uh, they decide to land their spacecraft near the city hall slash county government building. And that is the story of first contact between humans and aliens. It took place in Greenville, an ordinary, unremarkable town. And that's the art of the storyteller. Next time, more stories.